Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Who We Are podcast. Today, I am so honoured and privileged to have with us my dear friend and an inspiration to me, Janice. Hi, Hi Janice. Rachel. Hi, thank you for having me. So good to be here with you and so good to see you. It's been a while. It has. How have you been? Um, good. Good? Yeah. yeah. You yeah. look great. For those of us who may not be as familiar with you, could you share with us a little bit about yourself, your journey and how you got to where you are today? Wow. Um, uh, I, I sometimes find that difficult now to explain where I am because I've been on a journey of unpacking what that means. Mm. But I guess I would call myself uh, an actor. And that's what I've been doing for the last 30 years. Yeah. Beyond that, I've also been very much a, a vocal advocate for the arts. Mm -hmm. And part of that journey included um, serving as a nominated member of parliament. Yeah. Uh, representing the arts in Singapore. And more recently, um, having sort of encountered tongue cancer, mm. that was about two years ago, I've once again been on a journey of rediscovering yeah. who I am, what I am. Yeah. So here we are in the middle of this um water mm. that I'm swimming in that I could that is pretty fluid yeah. at the moment yeah. yeah yeah it can take any shape and form anytime yeah yeah beautiful well Janice you know thank you for also so courageously coming out to share about your journey and especially you know with what happened in the last couple of years could you walk us through you know the initial moment when you realized that hey, maybe something is seriously not right. And the emotions that came up to you when you heard your diagnosis. Um, I think when you discover something that is not right, um, you don't jump to the... Well, rather, I try not to jump to the worst conclusion. So for me, it was a little ulcer on my tongue. Mm. Um, I never thought very much about it. And I was at that time, this was in 2022, um, about to go into rehearsals for a show that was part of the Singapore Arts Festival. Mm. I was about to receive um, an honour from the French government as a <gasps> chevalier. Mm. Uh, for It was like a, kind of like a, a night of arts and letters. Wow, right? congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. It was an award. So there were a lot of like wonderful things on the horizon and my little ulcer was nothing that Seemed I thought innocent. was Im urgent or important. And then, not to say that I didn't deal with it because when it didn't go away, I did see a doctor, I did see an ENT uh, specialist, I did go back to the doctor again, mm. went to see a dentist, why, it's not, why is it not going away? And no one really rang out any alarms yeah. or red flags at that point because oral cancer is not common. Yeah. Tongue cancer is still pretty rare. So no one jumped to that conclusion. Mm. It was only after repeated visits to my dentist that he went, mm, I think you should get a biopsy done mm. just to make sure we know what it is. Yeah. And at that point, how long has it been, you know, since the day that you spotted right. your ulcer? So from that day to the day I got my yeah. diagnosis, it was at least three months wow. during which I got an award. I did my show, yeah. finished it, went to France for a holiday, came back and my ulcer was still there. And I'm like, I think I better do something about that. Um, yeah. Wow. Interesting how... We can also tell ourselves stories mm. um, to wish away what we think might be bad, you know? Wow. So I think there was a part of me that couldn't believe that it could be anything more. Mm. 
Because for something like tongue cancer, and I also read that, you know, typically it happens to men more than women and also male smokers, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. And so maybe that's also why, you know, the doctors did not immediately think that it might be yeah. cancerous. Yeah. Although the demographic, if I'm not wrong, is changing. It's changing. And there are more women now yeah. and they are getting younger. Yeah. And some of it is HPV related. HPV related, wow. Yeah. So when you first heard your diagnosis, what was it like? What was going through your heart, your mind? I think when we went in for the result, I was already prepared to hear the worst. Mm. And I am very much a doer person. Mm. I'm task-oriented. So when I heard the diagnosis, other than the initial um, disappointment mm. in the result, straight away I could remember my mind kicking into, okay, what do I need to do? Who do I need to see? Um, let's do it today. Mm. Who do I need to call mm. to make sure that I'm getting the best advice as to what the next steps are. Mm. And in the three days immediately following the diagnosis, I think I met nine doctors. Wow. It was a whirlwind of back to back consultations. Primarily because anything that has a tumor that needs to be taken out requires speed. Mm -hmm. You do need to act quite quickly mm. and and therefore making sure that that's the right course of action and what the um, results mean and getting good advice is quite important. Mm. And I was quite uh, fortunate to have friends who are oncologists or have access to people who could give me some perspective yeah. on what's going on. Yeah. That's quite important, but don't forget your nervous system at that time is in super high gear. Of course. And I can't imagine going through those three days again. Mm. It was extremely stressful. Yeah. yeah. And what, how did you find the strength, you know, to cope, especially during the initial period of shock, disappointment, you know, and then your, your mind also running to, okay, you know, back to back, what do I have to do next? Um, I find, I like being calm about these things. Um, and my husband as well. So that's very helpful. Yeah. I don't panic. Mm. Um, and I think I'm just that kind of person who likes to see the, I'm quite an optimist as in, yeah. Let's take it a day at a time, a step at a time, mm. and let each step inform my next decision. And even though it is a stressful, so under stressful circumstances, I think there's so much that is within our control yeah. that we can try and manage. Yeah. So for me, it was a few things, right? My own medical care and how I will systematically try and make sure I get the right care. And then parallel to that, how do we titrate the information to my kids, my family, my parents, mm. and manage that? Mm. Putting that, in fact, in the forefront took the attention away from myself. In a way, it, it helped me because I was more concerned about how it would impact them. Mm. Being well, yeah. recovering, and staying positive would be important for my family and yes. my kids. And that was what I focused had on. to focus on. Amazing. Yeah. You know, Janice, could you walk us through, you know, when you were in the doctor's office and was your, was your husband Lionel there with you? What did the doctor say to you at that time? So, um, I probably can't remember very much, mm. but um, for... For a case like mine, usually the first person you have to talk to is a surgeon mm. because surgery is the first um, immediate 
treatment option. And surgeons are very visual people. Yeah. They will draw it out for you <laughs> where it's located, how the uh, size what the size it. of it is, what needs to be done, and all the statistics around your survival and recovery rate will all be drawn out. Mm. And I remember, and I still have a notebook full of these drawings. So every, literally every visit I had to a doctor or any oncologist or specialist, I will bring my notebook. Mm. I wrote down everything. Because I do not trust my own brain in that room to remember or be able to process what I'm hearing, and it was very useful to then go back home mm. and review what they said. Or two weeks later, what were they referring to? Because yeah. some things may not make sense in the moment. And I kind of, you know, I'm, I'm that kind of student. Uh, <laughs> very hardworking <laughs> one. Take notes. So I, well, it helps. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah especially um, for such an important matter. Of course, Doctors being doctors go straight into the step-by-step -step treatment plan. Mm. But I think where, what I find most useful about my visits to them is when they are able to tell me things that I can do. Mm. So what was very important, for example, was I had two surgeons. My first surgeon ultimately said to me, you're not the doctor. It's really hard for you to worry about whether or not, or, or worry about the treatment options mm. in a way because you you can't tell if it's the right one. You're a layperson, right? You're not God either. And that there's a certain sense of the universe or God yeah. or it is in someone else's it's hands. Like surrendering. To, right? Yeah. So now what can you do? Wow. So he said, you can sleep. So make sure Rest. you put away your phone wow. and get enough sleep. You can drink a lot of water mm. so that you're hydrated. You can um, put on some weight mm -hmm. so that when we go into after surgery or if you go into radiation, you will lose weight and we need you to put on weight in advance for mm. that. Um, you can keep at your exercise while you can and if that gives you some kind of sanity or peace of mind or a sense of wellness, Please do that. Yeah. And so he listed me a couple of things that I could do and that was perfect because it gave me a sense of agency mm. over my health mm. and a sense of working towards a better outcome wow. as opposed to I'm helpless. I'm, I'm helpless. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is that is so useful and that is so helpful. You, I can also imagine, Janice, you know, when you had to go for back-to-back -back doctor visits, back-to-back -back scans, there must have been a lot of uncertainty and maybe even fear. What helped you also stay grounded and maybe even sane during this period? I don't try and worry about things I have no control over. So as far as possible, I don't look beyond the day. Mm. And try not to think too far ahead of, well, if this scan turns out like that, what's going to happen next? What's... I don't know. Wow. So it's very much a yoga practice mm. where I, I only have now. I only have my breath. I only have today. And if I kick it in the butt and do it well, great. And it's a win. Go and sleep. Tomorrow we try again. And I know it sounds almost simplistic, but it is amazingly effective in keeping you grounded and not in your head mm. too much, you know. Um, it, it definitely helped also to write. So literally on the first day, I took out my laptop and I paid for a journaling app. Mm. So Janice Cole, it's very Janice Cole. <laughs> <laughs> To be so almost like so practical about it, but I literally paid for a journaling app on the day of my diagnosis. Wow. Went home and I wrote everything that I was feeling. Yeah. And I even wrote all my symptoms. And it was a way of also keeping track of 
how I was feeling and yeah. compiling it and sending to my doctors. Hi, mm. you know, this is what I'm feeling today and it's a bit painful and blah, 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 blah. I have a role to play in my care and it was both a way of venting, yeah. releasing, but also having agency over where I want to be mm. uh, on this journey. Wow. And it also helps to meditate. So having some quiet time, 10-15 minutes of reflection or quiet was a way of also calming down all the nerves or anxiety. Yeah. So there are a few things and I try my best to still do that now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's beautiful. You know, it's such a great and consistent reminder of focusing on what we can control in a world where there are so many external factors or so many external situations that we may not be able to control. Janice, how has your experience with cancer reshaped your understanding of the meaning of life? Mm. Mm. I think very, very simply, it reprioritizes what is important. And I think it hit very close to home when I had... Okay, let's rewind a little bit. Yeah. I had done my first surgery. And we received the pathology on that tumor. And I sought a second opinion on what the next step should be. And the second opinion advised that I go in for mm -hmm. a second surgery to make sure that the margins are clear. Yeah. At which point, it became very real that I might not the way I speak ever again and it would be a life-changing moment and at that point my doctors looking at me were very afraid that I might not proceed and I said do whatever you need to keep me alive wow I don't care if I never act again if I never speak again because I have my husband, my parents, my two kids. I, I'm not done with life. I want to be around wow. for them. So what is my career? What is my achievements? It's not here to save me right now. That was the thought in my head. Everything that I've done in my past or every award or honour can't save me mm. now. I can save me now yeah. by saying yes to a possibly more aggressive aggressive treatment yeah. because I don't want to take a risk of it relapsing or recurring and yeah. so on. So I think, you know, in any medical, anyone going through a medical journey, there are key milestone points in your in that journey where you might have to make some hard decisions. But I think because love and family are so important to me, yeah. it was not a difficult decision to make. Wow. Yeah. I can only imagine, Janice, it's a huge decision because that's essentially like your whole identity. Yeah. As an actor, your voice plays a significant part of your identity. What was it like when you had to navigate you know, the emotional journey of rebuilding and redefining yourself again after this episode? I think I still am. Yeah. yeah. I think I still am. Identity is a very interesting thing. Mm. Um, I feel that I possibly have put too much emphasis on what I do as who I am, you know, um, and it's quite natural and quite human. And suddenly, I had no choice but to re-look really at who I am if I no longer do what I enjoy, love, have been good at for three decades. It 
was both a grieving process, but also an opportunity to cast off a cloak that I had worn for very long and thinking of a thinking a little bit of it as a Marie Kondo moment. <sighs> like, yes, it has been giving me joy, but is it time to ah uh, shake it off and declutter, you know? Wow. wow. Uh, and since I don't really have a choice, then declutter la. Mm. And maybe buy new clothes or look for new things to new ways of expressing who I am. I am still on that journey and um, I'm giving myself time to feel the feelings of what it means to not have that as part of my mask. Yet at the same time, do you know who you are in your core, where your self-esteem comes from, where your self-confidence comes from, where your self-assurance comes from? That is amazing, Janice. Well, I mean, I I try. And I think there are good days and bad days. Yeah. And it's a bit of a roller coaster. Um, it's so nice to hang on to things that make you comfortable and mm-hmm. make you feel good. Mm-hmm. Um about who you are. And what we have achieved. Yeah. But it's also, so much of it is ego. Vanity. Right? And um, it took a while. And it's, you know, to unpack and untether wow. from that. Wow. You talk a lot also about the stories we tell ourselves in a situation. We can, it is so powerful that we can talk ourselves in or out of a situation. Through some of the darkest times when you're battling this cancer, what are some of the things that you tell yourself or what is the story that you're telling yourself in your head? I I don't know if it's a story as much as Mm. being in touch with what, I want yeah. and accepting where yeah. I am. Wow. So what do I want? I mean, I guess you could say in the darkest moments, it could be right mm. in the being mired in, with all the side effects of radiation mm. and pain. And at that moment, what do I want? I want to be well. So I will turn up for radiation every day. That's what I will do for myself. Mm. What can I do now? I want to be happy. So I will invite help. I think um, it was a very interesting discovery of who I am under those circumstances. Because I don't think I've ever been tested in that way. And going through that and realizing, oh, I did all right. That was not too bad. It was in a very ironic way, some of my most joyful moments in my life. Mm. That three months of cancer treatment, because everything slowed down, I saw all the people I love regularly and spent time with them and spent time at home and was surrounded by love and care. With people that matter. Yeah. So I was very happy. Yeah. Isn't it weird? (laughs) If you think about it, it's like that should have been some of the most challenging moments and there were, but when I look back at that time, it was wow. very, very precious. Wow. Will you say that that was some of the greatest sources of strength and support through that period? I think um, the realization of what was important to me, mm-hmm. one, and the realization that I had the capacity to get through was very empowering. Yeah. Yeah. It was. A culmination of, 
in a way, my own attitude towards life, but also my life practice. So I'll give you an example. I don't think I would have gone through that in as good a shape if I did not have a certain spiritual practice. And when I say spiritual, I don't mean religious. I mean being able to tap into an inner universe yeah. and trust my instincts or gut, being able to show up even on a yoga mat when I'm tired and say, I will just do five minutes even if I'm tired. Mm. But this is for me. Mm. Same thing, I will show up for radiation even though sometimes people give up on radiation because it's too painful. And I'm going to show up Every for day. me every day. And those little things that in a way are a reflection of who you are, um, it showed me who I was. Mm. And I liked that person. Yeah. You know? So yes, I'm an actor. Yes, I may have won awards or whatever, but I love that. Where I am and how I dealt with the I illness showed me wow. who I really was. Well, it exposed. Usually crisis, it exposes who we are deep yeah. down. Or a, a, a really turbulent time or challenging time in our lives to expose who we are. And what you're saying is that you like who you've been exposed to. It sounds to me also that you've been keeping to your promises that you make to yourself. Whether big, whether small. Showing up on the yoga mat showing up for your treatments because it's, yes, for yourself, but it's also for the people that you love and you want yeah. to honour that. Yeah. You know, Janice, you spoke earlier also about asking and accepting help from the people around you, mm. which is something that actually a lot of us struggle with. What was that like for you? And what did you learn from that? When I shared my diagnosis with someone I knew who had gone through... Um, breast cancer, she said to me, please don't keep it to yourself. Right. Um, because she did at first and it destroyed her and she found that it was so much better to be open yeah. um, because then people will support rally around you. And that was a very important piece of advice for me. In particular because being a public figure and, and my illness being so obvious Mm. What's the point of hiding it? <laughs> you know? So Well, that's one way of looking yeah, at it. <laughs> it will come out at one point at some point. So I I I was very uh, mm. open about what I was going through mm. while managing people's concerns, right? And and the minute you tell people they want to help you but they don't know how. Mm. And by saying yes to whatever, make soup, yes. Yeah. Come over? Yes. Don't come over? Fine. Mm. Send flowers. Okay. Wow. Because people care. Yeah. And they want to tell you and show you that they are there for you, but yeah. they don't know how. And by saying yes and inviting them to be part of the experience that I'm going through was good for them, but was also good for me. Yeah. Um, on top of all that, I also kind of <laughs> I I I booked the I booked a physiotherapist. Mm. I booked a speech therapist. I booked a psychiatrist, wow. counselor, a therapist. All the professional my coach, help. Yeah, and I lined them all up, and I met them all before my surgery. And I said, I'm going to need your help. Wow. I want to I want to get better, but I I, I need help. Mm. And and I've had that relationship with them since. Mm. Even no. before your surgery. Yeah. Wow. Janice. I know I'm, I'm terrible. You're I'm such so a planner. Serious. No, but you're so serious about recovering. Yeah. 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 You know, a lot of people, they describe such life-altering experiences as moments of rebirth. Do you feel like this too? I think for sure. Yeah. It reminds me of what I've read about. So I read Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a... Yeah. Uh, He's a monk, right? I mean, he was, and he has written a lot of books mm. about meditation and so mm. on. And in one of his books, he writes about how um, monks, the Buddhist monks, had to meditate on 
corpses. Wow. Yeah. As a way of meditating on death. Mm. And I know it sounds almost morbid, but when you have a, a, a real life situation where you are really confronted with something as mind altering as the possibility of your death, um, it does become very real. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Time, Time becomes a scarce good. Uh, and when you realize it, you will start to decide a bit more carefully how you want to spend it and where you want to put your energy and whether or not mm. all these stresses in your life are worth your bandwidth and your anger or your stress. If time is running out, why not be joyful? Why would you want to be in that state, you know? How has your relationship with your family, in particular your kids, changed during this time? For them and all through the process, I tried very hard to keep it as calm and seamless as possible. I share what I'm going through so they never have to worry or not know what's going on. And so for context, you have two boys? Yeah. And they are aged? So I have two boys. And they are now 20 and 18. 20 and 18. My goodness, they have grown. Yeah. And um, I try and be there or be around a lot more. Yeah. As an actor, for so many years, I've been away mm. from, from dinner, from birthday parties, from whatever, events, yeah, because I've had to be... Because I've had to travel, tour, or be in the theatre. And I think I do have some feelings about whether or not that was healthy mm. for me. It was what I wanted and what I found joy in. But now when I think about it, I feel it also... I was not as present as I was, would have liked to be when they were growing up. And now I want to be present. I want to be here at dinner talking to you across the table. And it doesn't matter what we talk about, you know. Just being in each other's presence, spending time together. Yeah, now, right now. And um, you know how is we say we talk about quality time over quantity time? There's something to be said about quantity time. Yeah. And that one or two holidays a year to make up for all the little days that I wasn't there, I want to be there in the day-to-day -day, in some way. And so I try and make space for that uh, with them in whatever manner if I can, yeah. Looking back, you know, would you say anything to younger Janice when you had the opportunity? Learn to say no <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's all tied up with ego, identity, achievement mm. that makes it, that made it challenging at that time for me to say no. Because saying yes means saying yes to more, more Opportunities, what? more, yeah. yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It's just whether or not that was always the right decision. Yeah. Yeah. I would say... You don't have to take up every job as a way of justifying who you are or, or what you can do. Because there was a period where I said yes to everything. And it was a way of making myself feel like I was enough, I suppose. And needed. Yeah. And... Um, there was a cost. There was a cost. And that was time put into other areas of my life which were important but sometimes took second place. Yeah. Yeah. In times of crisis, many of us might grapple with faith and doubt. How did that play out for you? I am, because I'm not a religious person, mm. That doesn't mean I don't believe in a God mm. or a higher 
being. Yeah. And for me, um, so there was no sense of doubting, mm. but more of I can only control what I can control. And if the wider universe will turn the situation in a way where it's not what I want, then I will have to learn to accept that. Wow. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel acceptance of where we are or how things are is such a critical part of finding peace. Mm. Otherwise, we are constantly struggling mm. and life becomes a real struggle. Mm. And yet, it's the, one of the hardest things to do. How do you define success and fulfillment now? And how has, how has that evolved over the years? There's a moment in the film by her shoemaker called Ajuma. Mm. And in that moment, toward the end of the film, the lead female character is left all alone because her son has moved away. Her husband is no longer there. Her mother-in-law, whom she cared for almost all, for so many years, has passed on. And now she is alone. And in the film, I just thought to myself, wow, is she successful? Is, is she successful when all the people whom she worked so hard all her life as a homemaker for are not even with her anymore. Is she successful? And I can only think, yes, if she chooses to believe that it was worth every moment of her time. And therefore, I feel, to answer that question, it has to lie in you. Are you successful? Can you answer that without having to depend on someone else to tell you you're successful? If you can get that, sense of, yeah, I'm good. I did well. Then you're successful. Ah. Mm. Why do you have to wait for someone else to tell you? Or some kind of endorsement from a third party. Yeah. If you're waiting and looking for that, you might end up quite bitter and quite disappointed if it doesn't come. Mm. Um, so that's what success looks like. Yeah, and that's a beautiful reminder. Was there a quote or a saying or anything or word that you held tightly to during this entire period? The first thing I wrote when I came out of surgery uh, two years ago was a quote from Pema Children. And it was, start where you are. Wherever that may be. Wherever you are, wherever you are, there's no perfection, there's no perfect meditator, yeah. there's no perfect... Anything, start where you are and we will put one foot in front of the other and journey from here. Yeah. There's no need to look back at your past or what have you done or do I deserve this yeah. or why me? Why, why bother <laughs> with those questions mm -hmm. when you have today and tomorrow and the day after? So it was wise uh, to not be too um, hell-bent or concerned about what brought you here. It's over. Yeah. Look forward. Mm. And on that note, what are you looking forward to and excited about for this new season of your life <sighs> and journey? I think um, I know I'm in a period of change. And that's quite exciting. I want to lean into it. I set aside this year and maybe the coming year to learn new things. Because if I want to change, then I can't hang on to what I know. I need to expand yeah. your mind. So that's right. Toolbox. So I signed up for a Japanese course so <laughs> I could learn Japanese. I... On the very on the very last minute, kind of whim, 
decided to do a teacher certification course in Fitzmaurice voice work. Wow. So that I can teach voice work. Wow. And you must be thinking, oh my God, listen to her. Someone who is so worried about losing her voice, teaching voice, well, that's precisely why I need to go to where it is uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's part of building the resilience and stamina for change, I feel. Wow. Being uncomfortable. Wow. Um, and I also, in the transition, feel I've been so fortunate to do something that I love so passionately as my job. And now it's like, how am I going to find the next thing that I will be equally passionate about? So I don't know what that might be. Mm. So I need to go on a excavation, Explore. investigation path, yeah. And we're so excited, you know, to see, you know, what happens next, especially as you write the next chapters of your life. Yeah, or dictate it into a <laughs> phone. Or dictate it. <laughs> but Janice, thank you so much for sharing your heart, your journey, your lessons, your wisdom. I have personally been so impacted just sitting here watching you. It is just so inspiring. Thank you. A lot of us, you know, we always read about the regrets of the people in their dying days and if they could relive their life or live better, how would they do it differently? And for me, you answered that consistently again and again through the last hour that we've spent together and I hope so much wisdom that you've shared, whether it is focusing on what we can control and actually there's so much that we can control even in a world that may seem chaotic mm. and secondly it's always going back to the habits that will ground us you know mm. for you it was journaling meditating doing your yoga practice showing up for yourself because in all of this you're actually slowly rebuilding yourself and your confidence again and that is something so important especially when you're riding the ups and downs of the waves of life and I think so much for me to think about also on like being present with the children, learning to say no, drawing boundaries, and really questioning and asking myself, if I were to choose something, what am I really choosing it for? Is it for eco or is it really serving me in this season? Mm. So mm. I gained so much from this conversation, Jen. It's oh, much I'm more glad. than you will ever know. <laughs> for those of us who want to continue following you on this journey, um, where can we find you? And where well, can we um, support you? I guess on Instagram, uh, Facebook for people who are more in my generation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I share what I can and when I feel like sharing, I, I'm also very um, sensitive and to my relationship with social media mm. and feel that you know, it's not always healthy for everyone to be too obsessed with what is being shown there um, and that you have to be quite discriminant and discerning about who you're following and why. Yeah. And for myself, I'm not going to be... You know, I, 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 I think two, three, four times about what I'm posting and why I'm posting it because um, FOMO is a real thing and yeah. there's no need to put out more stuff out there that makes people feel bad about not being part of it. Mm. We all live interesting, unique lives and are full of our own richness. And we just have to trust that it is as happy as the next person. And social media doesn't even tell you the opposite. <laughs> Janice, thank you for who you are, what you're doing and what you're sharing. Thank you for being the voice of hope, of inspiration to us and our generation. Thank you so much for, for being here. Me. 